Then there was Plato. Plato was very influenced by Pythagoras, who had shown mathematical truths. You may remember uh, Pythagoras' theorem in a right angle triangle, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. Plato was very interested in the truth. What is the underlying truth? Then we had Aristotle. Among other things, Aristotle believed that men had more teeth in their mouth than did women. And although he was married twice, he never asked either of his wives to open their mouth to count their teeth. He didn't need to because he knew. With horses, the stallion has more teeth than the mare, so he established as a general principle that the male of the species has more teeth than the female, therefore he had more teeth than his wives, and that was easier than counting, they probably had bad breath anyway. Now, so what Aristotle did, he said, from the past, let us create boxes, categories, definitions. Then we come across something, we analyze it down so we can recognize it, then we judge, does it fit in this box or does it not fit in this box? Something could not both fit and not fit, and it couldn't be anywhere else. Those are Aristotle's two principles. From that arose our method of thinking, which is very largely concerned with argument. In argument, A has a point of view, B has a point of view, they argue, B seeks to prove A wrong, A seeks to prove B wrong, occasionally you get the synthesis of both. Now that system is fine, it's a very useful system, very useful for discovering the truth. But it was never, never designed to be constructive. It is a system which is very lacking in constructive energy, very lacking in creative energy, very lacking in design energy, because it was never intended for those purposes. It was intended to discover what is. What is the truth? Now, in a stable world, that's fine. In a stable world, the boxes from the past are every bit as useful in the future. But not so in a changing world. In a changing world, the boxes may not apply. In a changing world, we need design. How we put things together. It's the difference between what is, existing knowledge, existing routines, and what can be creativity, construction, design. All our emphasis has been on that, not enough on what can be. So we need to develop, we need to invent a constructive idiom of thinking which is not normally part of the Western tradition of thinking, which has a very good idiom for discovering the truth called argument, not one for designing something better. So that is where we come to parallel thinking. Parallel thinking, instead of A arguing with B, A and B are thinking together, in parallel, in the same direction, cooperatively. Now, of course, we need to vary the direction. And for that, we invent a very simple framework, which is the six hats. Six hats means that as someone sits thinking, there are imaginary metaphorical hats which you put on or take off. You wear one hat at a time. Now, what are these hats? Well, we start with the first hat. The first hat is a, the white hat. You can think of white as paper, printout, computer printout. White hat is what information is available what information is needed, what information is missing, and, very important, how are we going to get the information we need. White Hat is a direct focus on information. When the White Hat is in use, everyone in that group wears the White Hat, everyone is focusing on information. If the information does not agree, even if it's contradictory, you put it down in parallel. You accept both versions. Later, when you come to design the outcome, you need to decide between them, then you decide between them, or design something which satisfies both. So that's the white hat, direct, exclusive focus on information. Then we move to the next hat. The next hat is the red hat. 
you can think of red as far and warm. The red hat is feelings. Feelings, intuition, and emotions. Normally, in uh, thinking, you're not supposed to allow your emotions to come in. Of course, they come in anyway, you just disguise them as logic. What the red hat does, it allows you to signal that this is your feeling. You're not pretending it's anything else. Now, intuition can be based on a lot of experience in the field, which comes together to give you a gut feeling. That is very useful. Does not mean it's always right. It's not always right. When they told Einstein about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Einstein says, my intuition says that's wrong. God doesn't play dice. Nature doesn't work that way. Turned out the great Einstein's intuition was wrong. Heisenberg was right. But the red hat allows you to put forward intuition, feelings, emotions, without any need to explain or justify them. Then we come to the next hat. The next hat is the black hat. You can think of black as the judge's robes. The black hat is caution. Caution. Caution, risk assessment, and critical. Why something doesn't fit our ethics, our value, our budget, our policy, whatever it is. Black hat is an extremely useful hat. Possibly the most useful hat because it stops us doing things which are dangerous, damaging, polluting, and so on, illegal, and so on. Very, very useful hat. But it is very easy to overuse. Now, that's rather like wine. Wine is excellent, tastes nice, and reduces the incidence of heart attack. At least it does if you're a Frenchman. But too much wine can give you cirrhosis of the liver and make you an alcoholic. That is not the fault of the wine. That is the fault of overuse. Food is necessary. Too much food can make you overweight with possible health problems. Not the fault of the food, the fault of overuse. Now, the, the reason I emphasize this is far too many people believe that somehow the black hat is a bad hat. It is not. It is an excellent hat, possibly the most useful. But with it, we look at the caution areas, the difficulties, the dangers. That does not make it a bad hat. A judge who's sitting in court deals with criminals most of the time, does not make the judge a criminal. Keep that very clearly in mind. Black hat is evaluation, caution, very, very important hat. Then we come to the next hat. The next hat is the yellow hat. I draw brown because yellow doesn't show too well with my pens. That's the yellow hat. The yellow hat is the logical positive. In a sense, the black hat is the logical negative, but on the whole, I don't like calling the black hat negative because people get the wrong idea that somehow it's a bad hat. Yellow hat, logical positive, we make a strong effort to look for benefits. Benefits, values, and how we can make something work. But we must show the support for it, the logical reasons for it. The yellow hat, the logical reasons. Yellow hat is much, much more difficult than the black hat. Black hat is very natural. The brain has a very natural mechanism for saying that is not what I'm used to, that is not what it's supposed to be. That is very natural. The brain does not have an equivalent mechanism for saying that has benefits, that has value. Therefore, we need really to develop that yellow hat attitude looking for benefits, looking for value, it does not come as naturally as the black hat. So very key hat. We need to develop a skill in doing it. We need to develop what I call value sensitivity. Value sensitivity, the word sensitivity is the same as sensitive photographic film. Value sensitivity means that we develop a high sensitivity to value. If we look at that with a golfing analogy, imagine you're playing golf and you get the ball on the green and then you try very hard to get it in the hole. And some people think that's important. Now, just imagine how much easier golf would be if the green was shaped like that. 
So when you got the ball here, it rolled down by itself and got in the hole. That's the same with value sensitivity. If you don't devalue values, develop value sensitivity, then you've got to see the value directly staring you in the face. But if you develop value sensitivity, then from a distance, you can sense the value and come towards it. So yellow hat, value sensitivity, very important part of thinking.